Ron is currently the Fingerhut Professor of Education at the American Jewish University, formerly the University of Judaism in Los Angeles, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1975. He has also served as Dean of the Fingerhut School of Education, Vice President and Founding Director of the Wisden Center for the Jewish Future and the Wisden Institute for Jewish Family and Life. That's a lot of wisdom. It's a lot of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> the book, First Fruit, a Wisdom Anthology of Jewish Family Education, which he co-edited with Adrian Bank, won the 1999 Jewish Book Award. Ron's interest in synagogue dates back to his involvement in a conservative synagogue, Bethel, in his hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. Yes. Over the years, he has visited hundreds of synagogues across North America and around the world. As a consultant, teacher, and scholar in residence, widely recognized for his passionate, insightful, and awful, often humorous presentation. No, awful, <laughs> awful humorous. <laughs> awful humorous, awful. awful. Ron is the co-founder of Synagogue 2000 with Rabbi <laughs> Lawrence Hoffman, and currently serves as co-president of Synagogue 3000. You don't look a thousand. <laughs> a catalyst of excellence, empowering congregations and communities to create synagogues that are sacred and vital centers of Jewish life. Family is the center of Ron's life, and he and his wife Susie have recently been blessed with the birth of their second grandchild, Yes, Gabrielle Elijah Hall. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Ron Wilson. Nice job, Gary. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Wait a minute. I'm in the South. Hey. Hey. Ha, ha. Wait a minute. I learned this at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. I was on a 10-day tour in January. So I learned the plural of y'all is all y'all. So how all y'all? Y'all y'all good? All y'all all right? Oh my goodness. Do you know about this? First of all, thank Gary, everybody, for picking me up and schlepping me around. So I've been doing this for a lot of years, and it's the first time I got picked up by a guy at the airport, and he, I get to the car, and the whole back of the car is smushed in. I mean, he's that, I mean, I mean, he was in a terrible accident. When was it? Three days ago? Three days ago, he's in this terrible accident. The whole back of the car is smushed in. So I said to him, you know, if I got on American Airlines this morning in Los Angeles and I saw there was a ding in the airplane, <laughs> you think I would have got on that plane? <laughs> I would have taken the next flight to Dallas. It's a miracle we're here. Thank you very much, Gary. <laughs> nice job. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm in the Institute of Southern Jewish Life on a 10-day tour uh, back in uh, January. It was fantastic. We did 1,000 miles from New Orleans, Alexandria, Louisiana, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, then we went down to Pensacola, Flor Birmingham, Alabama, the day after the Crimson Tide won the national championship. Whoa. And then, uh, where'd we go? Pensacola, Florida, and uh, Mobile, and then Baton Rouge. 10 days, 1,000 miles for this fabulous organization, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. So we'll give a shout out to them, give them a nice round of applause. So, yeah, it's true. We have this little grandbaby. It's unbelievable. Actually, we finished the tour of the South, of that, that tour, on Sunday, January 13th, and the baby was born on Monday, January 14th. It was a planned cesarean section. So my daughter, but this Ann Kimball, who was running the thing for me for 10 days from the Institute, she was so nervous that our daughter would go into labor early. But thank God, all went as planned. It was great. Uh, eight days, my daughter is a planner. Her name is Javi. So she, this is her second child, she planned the bris first. She knew it was a boy, because she's the kind of kid who when we had Hanukkah, my wife Susie would make these fabulous displays of presents, one for every night of Hanukkah. Javi, first night of Hanukkah, opened every single present. <laughs> She could not wait. So now she's pregnant for the second time. You want to bet she wanted to know if it was a boy or a girl. Well, as soon as she knew it was a boy, she figured the bris could be on Martin Luther King's birthday because it's a day off. So she told the doctor she wanted the baby on January 14th. And it worked out. Isn't that amazing? And I got to be the sandak. Who knows what a sandak is in a bris? A sandak is the... 
Yeah, a sandak's the guy who holds the baby while the... Yeah. yeah. So, I, it, right, slices and dices. So I actually... <laughs> Our kids live in San Jose because my son-in-law works for a small internet company in the Silicon Valley. It's called Google. Have you heard of it? So they've been living up there. So the Moyle had to be somebody from up there, not from my home. You know, now I live in Los Angeles. So my daughter says, well, don't worry, Dad. We've been interviewing the Moyles. I say, been interviewing the Moyle? Yeah, there are five. There are five of them that work the, <laughs> the Silicon Valley. So, uh, you know, two of them are trained by the reform movement, there's the Orthodox guy, and then there are a couple others. So she's been interviewing Maulim for the last six months. So I asked her, so who made the cut? <laughs> Bad joke. But, but anyway, if you want to check this out, it's on my Facebook page. Uh, I'm the Sandak. Our kids wrote their own original ceremony for the bris and it was quite beautiful and I'm holding little Gabriel seven pounds on my lap I'm sitting on Elijah's chair it's the first time I've done this because our other granddaughter is a little girl and I'm holding this little pitzkala this little do you know any Yiddish this little baby this little you know seven pound little baby and it's about a 25 minute ceremony. It was a real engaging, wonderful, our friends and family are there and their friends are there. And it comes the end of the ceremony and the Moyle says, Mazel Tov. And everybody starts singing, Simon Tov and Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. And Simen. it was wonderful. And then something came over me. I'm still holding the baby and I held, the, I got up from the chair and I held the baby high over my head and I said, Hakuna Matata. <laughs> A new king is born. <laughs> so, do any of you know who Craig Talman is? Yeah. Craig Talman is a wonderful musician. He's a good friend of mine. So Craig calls me and says, how was the bris? And I told him about my <laughs> Hakuna Matata moment. He says, send me the photo. So we have a great photo of this, of me holding the baby high over my head. Send me the photo, he says. That was on Monday night last week. On Tuesday morning, Craig has posted it on Facebook and he's photoshopped the words coming out of my mouth, Hakuna Matata. So there's, <laughs> check it out, it's on my Facebook page too. And I'm telling you, there are like hundreds of likes and all kinds of things. It was unbelievable. So thank you for the Mazel Tov. Say Mazel Tov. Thank you very much. It's great to be in your neighborhood. I'm thrilled to be here. I did grow up in Omaha, Nebraska in a conservative synagogue where I went to Hebrew school Monday, Wednesday, 4 to 6. Any of you go to Hebrew school Monday, Wednesday, 4 to 6? Tuesday, Thursday, 4 to 6? Sunday morning, 9 to 12? Did you have Mr. Friedman? <laughs> I ha what was his name? Racanti. Mr. Racanti. Good Jewish name, Mr. Racanti. I had Mr. Friedman for three years in a row, Bet, Gimel, and Dalit. We had a hard time finding Hebrew school teachers in Omaha. We have 5,000 Jews in Omaha. Very tough to find Hebrew school teachers. This guy Friedman was not really a Hebrew school teacher. His real profession, he sold appliances at Sears. That was his real profession. But he came every afternoon to the synagogue to try to teach us kids a little Yiddish kite, a little bit about being Jewish. I was coming, on the other hand, from a full day of public school, 8.30 to 3.30. I would rather have been doing anything else but another whole two hours of school. Uh, be on the playground, watch the Mickey Mouse Club, I mean, anything but another two hours of school. So I became what is known in Yiddish, Mr. Friedman used to call me this, I'll translate, Vilda Chaya, he called me. <laughs> it means wild animal. Because I would do stuff in Hebrew school that would drive this man crazy. And he was from the old country. He was from Russia. He had this very high, little, thick accent like this. And he would try to teach us kids a little Yiddish kite. And uh, I would do these little things to him that get him off the subject. And he would yell one of two things at me when he got really upset. This was the first. Shake it! Shake it! Shake it! Shake it! Shake it! 
It's a Hebrew word. You know what it means? Not the way he was saying it. it mean, uh, <laughs> shut up is what it meant. Shick it, shick it, shick it. That's what he said all afternoon. This is all I heard. Shick it. This is a true story. All my stories are true. When I went for my first bar mitzvah lesson in Omaha at Bethel Synagogue, the teacher, the consult, the guy who was the shamus, the guy who was teaching the bar mitzvah kids, also from the old country. And like those guys from the old country, the first thing he did in the first lesson, he pinched my cheek and he said to me, Sonny, what's your name in Hebrew? I said, Sheket. <laughs> True. I thought my Hebrew name was Sheket Ben Avraham for the longest time. The other thing he would yell at me was a, a curse. <laughs> I can't believe that he actually cursed me in Yiddish, but he translated it into English, and it came out like this. Get beat red in the face, Mr. Friedman. And he'd yell this instruction. Wolfson, go to the back of the room and spit in your own face. <laughs> Do you have any idea what that means? <laughs> I'm nine years old. I would try it. I'd go and tweet. <laughs> I'll tell you what saved my Jewish life. Two things. Two things saved my Jewish life. The first one was my family. I grew up in a loving Jewish family. I'm going to talk about it in the talk on blessings and kisses. Fabulous Jewish, warm Jewish family. My Bubby and my Zadie. And if I could only be as good a Bubby and Zadie as my Bubby and uh, Zadie as my Zadie was, and my wife Susie is a fabulous Bubby. She even has a pin that says Bubby. Um, that's an honorific title in our family. Uh, I'd be quite blessed. Uh, but the other thing was our synagogue. Because even though the Hebrew school experience for me was not so good, um, I loved being a shul per a kid. I was a shul kid. I would go every Shabbos to shul. Um, and my mom, uh, may her soul rest in peace, uh, wanted that for us kids. I have two younger brothers. And... Um, she encouraged us to go to the synagogue. And my mom sang in the volunteer choir at Bethel Synagogue for 25 years, every Friday night, at the late service, 8.15. She was an alto, and she would sing in the choir. And she one year said to our cantor, Aaron I. Edgar, may he rest in peace, uh, cantor, why don't we have a junior choir? Because a lot of the kids like to sing. So guess what? He agreed. And I tried out for the choir, and I got in, and it was very cool because uh, once a month, on a Friday night at the late service, we got to these little blue robes that we kids put on. I was 10 years old. And we got trotted out onto the pulpit, the bima, to sing the one song we learned in the three years I was in junior choir. <laughs> this is the song. Would you pick up your... Uh, your sheet, please. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, the song went like this. Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Yisrael I see some of you know it. Do you know it? Do you know it? Do you know it a little lower? We'll do it a little lower, all right? If you don't know the, the tune, I'll, I'll teach it to you right now, okay? So it goes like this. Matovu. Let's try that, ladies. Matovu. Next part. Oh, Try or, Try the whole thing now. Matovu. Oh, Here's the next part. Listen. Wait, 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 wait. Listen. You're way ahead of me. Mishkenotecha. Try that. Mishkenotecha. Now from the beginning. Matovu. Oh, Halecha Yaakov, Mishkenotecha. Last three notes, listen. 
Yisrael. Try that. Yisrael. Excellent. Now, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, wherever else you're from, here we go. Matovu. Oh, halecho yako, mishkeno techa, yisra. Excellent. Now, Gary really knows this song. Get up here, man. Okay, so right down the middle, right here, this side, you're with Gary. Gary, get over here, babe. Right here, right here down the middle, this side, you're going to start. This whole group, you're with me. Watch for my downbeat. Ready? Chodstein Shalosh. Matovu. Oh. Matovu. Oh. Halakoya. Mishkenote. One more time, Gary. Matovu. Good. Matovu, oh halako yako, Mishkenah, Yisra. Let's have a big round of applause for the Tidewater Choir. Here we go. Thank you, Gary. Nice job. Let's do a little um, text study now. Mom means what? What? Exactly right. It means what? Or it means how. Passover is around the corner, friends, and most of your Haggadot, your Passover Haggadahs, mistranslate the word ma in Manashtana Halayla Hazeh as why is this? That's incorrect. It's incorrect. Ma is, means what or how. Madua means why. So it actually in your Haggadah uh, means how different this night is and then you get the questions if you're more interested in that we don't have the books but I have a little book on Passover so you can check that out ma means what tovu root word is tov a word that means good a word I never heard in Hebrew school not <laughs> once <laughs> so far we have how good are oh halecha the root word is Oh hell, which means a tent. So far we have how good are your tents. It's a plural. Yaakov is Jacob, uh, one of our ancestors. Mishkenotecha comes from the word mishkan, which means a temple, a place of prayer. You see the declensions down below. And here I translate it as your prayer places. Yisrael is Israel. But who is Israel? the descendants of Jacob. Israel is another name of Jacob, of Yaakov. Jacob's initial name was Yaakov, the one that holds on to the heel of a brother, a twin brother. And he's going to confront his twin brother, Esau. And he wrestles with an angel of God, and his name is changed to Yisrael, the one who wrestles with God. We are the B'nai Yisrael, the descendants of the one who wrestles with God. But I was in New Orleans for the first time, and they have those French donuts called beignets. We are the beignet Israel. That's what we are. I know, bad, bad, bad. Okay, so the whole thing means, how good are your tents, Jacob? Your prayer place is Israel. Now, who knows when we sing this prayer in the service, in the worship service, in the synagogue? When do we sing this? Very beginning. First thing you say when you walk into a synagogue, how come? I think the answer is that the rabbis who chose this uh, to be the first thing you say when you walk into a synagogue thought of their synagogues as tents. They probably were tents, the first places of prayer. So now how many of you have ever been in a tent? Can I just see hand? Really? Jews in tents? I can't believe it. <laughs> I said to my wife Susie once, honey, let's go camping. She said, the Marriott will be fine. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> How many of you actually have been to... Huh? Oh, I didn't say that. Okay. 
So, and then some of you may have been to Israel and have seen the Bedouin tents when you go from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. What I'd like you to do first tonight, this is not going to be a lecture, we're going to be working together. So, uh, the first thing I want to ask you is, put the image of a tent in your head, in your mind. See a tent, okay? And now, good, you got it? All right, now when I say go, we have people from lots of different communities here, sacred communities, synagogue communities, federation community, thanks for hosting here in this beautiful JCC. Um, when I say go, and I'm only gonna give you three minutes to do this, I want you to pretend it's Shabbat in your synagogue, or it's a high holiday, or it's something like that, and you got a whole bunch of people in the room that you don't know. Or maybe there's a big bar bat mitzvah going on in your synagogue. You got a lot of guests in from out of town. You don't know them. So what I want you to do is go meet somebody in this room you don't know, introduce yourself to that person, and then answer this question. How is a good synagogue, or how should a good synagogue, be like a good tent? What is there about a good tent that should inform how we think about building good synagogues in the 21st century? Three minutes. One, two, three, go! Get up! Go, go, go! Go meet somebody! Meet somebody you don't know. Meet somebody you don't know. <laughs> you know everybody. You're so skinny. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I'm only halfway there. You're doing great. You're doing great. Oh, sure, yeah. I know him okay. well. Uh, we, 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 we were at Dominion Monday night, White Night. Oh. And we we call it our jury duty. Oh, we got, wow. We, we got our, yeah. uh, That's then, nice. The, anyway, I had the, the rabbi make a little a speech for this little five-year-old boy. Was, uh, I mean, a, a bracha for this five-year-old boy that was got three. I thought it was, I thought it was very nice and good. I thought it was very nice and Great. Thank you. Can you I, repeat the question? How's a good synagogue like a How's good tent? a good synagogue like, like a, a good tent? Okay, you know, Got it? I used to live in Kearney. In fact, Kearney, I Nebraska? In, in fact, I lived in Papillion. Really? For a very short time. Lonsman. Okay, everybody, come on and have a seat. Okay. Yeah, got his I know. All right. Come on, sit down. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. I don't think we should ever shush anybody in a synagogue. I really don't. I'm serious about it. Uh, someone said, yell Shek yet. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it because I don't think we should. I think it's rude. So I think find a technique like this or another technique to get people's attention. All right, so now how's a good synagogue like a good tent? Come on, let's get a list get together. I want you to be thinking about it. Yes, sir. Huh? Upper Michigan, you do that. Upper Michigan? Sure, that's where you do that. Do fishing and everything like that. Oh, okay, good. Intense, right? Like even on the lake. There's no Jewish people up there. No Jewish people up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's a good synagogue like a good town? Please. It's an intimate place. 
Yeah, you don't intimate. Touch inside, you go up and say I. Right. And so good. It's an intimate place. It's not a huge place. Now I haven't been in your synagogues yet, but and I don't know how big they are, but I've been in hundreds of synagogues, and I've been in some that are small and intimate, and really cozy, like a tent. I've been in others that are cavernous sanctuaries where you can get lost. And then there's something in it, I don't know what it is about Jewish people. You'll come in on Shabbat morning, the sanctuary will be, you know, huge, three, four, five, six hundred seats. We've got three people sitting here, and four people sitting there, and two people sitting there. And I don't get it. And I know synagogues that have tried to make a big space more intimate by roping off seats, and people rip the ropes off, and they say, no, sir, I'm sitting in that seat, and that's it, you know? But I'm telling you folks, one of the things that I write about in this book, The Spirituality of Welcoming, is that it's hard to do prayer, it's hard to do worship if people are spread out all over a big space. So to try to make our spaces more intimate is a great first suggestion. What else, please? It's warm and the people inside are warm. Yeah, they're, it's warm and welcoming. So I wrote this book called The Spirituality of Welcoming and it's all about that. It's all about how do you create a feeling of warmth in a place where I hear, I go on these trips and I visit places and I hear horror stories. Time after time, I'm sure it's not true in your community, but I hear horror stories of people say to me, oh, I went shul shopping. You know what shul shopping is? So I'm new in town, I'm gonna go try out the different shuls, the different synagogues. And I hear stories. I was in a Midwestern state that starts with the letter O, and a city that starts with the letter C. You have several choices. And I ask a person, I meet a, this wonderful guy after services, I do my talk and after service I say to him, how did you choose this synagogue? He says, well, I went shul shopping and this was the only one when I first walked in, someone said hello. I said, you mean you went to the other synagogues and nobody said hello? Yep. It's shocking. And some of you who are here are leaders of your synagogues, and you know what it's like. You go to your synagogue, it's fantastic. Oh, my friends are there, I know the rabbi, it's great. And then the stranger, the person who's a guest of the bar mitzvah walks in, and you're having a great time talking to your friends or talking to the rabbi or the canner or whoever, and then what's happening to this person who's new in town? or doesn't know anybody. And it's hard to be in that situation. Some, then people tell me stories about how they go to a bar mitzvah and they visit a synagogue that's not their own and they walk in, the same thing happens. So warm and welcoming is really important. Uh, those of you who are coming back Sunday, we're gonna do actually hands-on training on how to be warm and welcoming, including I'm gonna train all of you how to be greeters. How to be, do this very critical work of greeting another human being like the image of God they are. Okay, what else about a tent? Please. Its doors are open. Yeah. I love the Bedouin tent because there's always a flap open. And that open door says, come on in. So I'm in another synagogue in that state of O, in another city C, and I walk down. This is, uh, granted, it was before September 11th, and I know there's security issues in synagogues. But I walked around that place, that synagogue I was visiting, for a half an hour before I could find an open door. No kidding, I walked around and around. Front doors were locked, the office doors were locked. I walked around, walked around, walked around. I finally found an open door. It was the door to the kitchen. So I walk into the kitchen, I find the executive director of the synagogue. I say to him, you know, I've been walking around here for a half an hour, I couldn't find a way in. He said, you know what he said to me? You won't believe this. Ron, Everybody knows to come in through the kitchen. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, right. What else about, so yeah, an open, and by the way, there are many doors into a synagogue. Some people come through the door of prayer. They want to be there to worship. Some come through the door of social justice. They're interested in fixing the world. Some come through the door of study. They, I know synagogues where people show up on Saturday morning to do Torah study and then they go home. They don't even stay for the service. It's happening in my own conservative synagogue right now, Valley Beth Shalom and Encino. 
Rabbi Ed Feinstein, a fabulous teacher, 9 to 10. He's teaching, and a lot of the people go home afterwards. They don't stick around because they don't want to be there. for. Okay, at least they've shown up. They're there to learn. Some people go through the door of volunteer work. There should be many open doors of involvement and engagement in your synagogue. Okay, what else? Come on, about a good tip, please. Because the walls are fabric, ah. you're, you separate yourself from the outside world, so uh -huh. you have a true indwelling, right. but it's a very mm. temporary mm. creation. It's not a wall. Yeah. So you can block the sensation from interfering with I love that. Sure. You know that it's a that Jewish law requires a synagogue to have a window. Why? So that's right. So you're not totally isolated. We're not monks. We don't sit in monasteries. We are connected to the outside world, even as we try to create the space of comfort and safety. Uh, safety from what? You ever been in a tent when it started to rain? We're going to have some rain tonight, folks. What? Have you ever been in a tent when it's raining? Well, like a good synagogue, the, the roof ought not to leak. Uh, it ought to be secure. But it also, did I hit a bad nerve here? <laughs> it ought not to leak. But, but seriously, it, but think of another metaphor. A synagogue ought to be like a tent, a refuge from the storms, from the storms of your life. There's not a person in this room that hasn't had a storm in their lives. And when you have that storm in your life, whether it's an illness or a problem at work or you lose a job or whatever it is, boy, if you are engaged in the life of a synagogue, you have a place of refuge. You have a tent to go to to get comfort from your friends and your community. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, that happens too. Yes, it's the best dangerous of all, Rabbi. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that's true. And uh, when I visit a community, in about five minutes, I know, I write this in my book, I know in five minutes, from the airport to the synagogue, whether there's a storm in that tent. <laughs> You know, this one doesn't like this one, or the rabbi's in trouble, or they're the canner, or this, that. And you know what my view of this is? We're too small. We really are. And we have too many people who are not engaged in synagogue life. I don't know, what, what's the affiliation rate in the Tidewater Bay? Where are we? Tidewater, is that what it's called? Huh? 50%? No kidding. But I'll tell you something. In my community, in the Southern California, it's about 15% affiliation. Okay? So if you've got 50%, you're already doing pretty good. In Omaha, Nebraska, it's 80%. So you have 5,000 Jews. Everybody needs to belong to something, a JCC or a synagogue or a federation or something. So I'll tell you what. We've got some work to do if it's 50%. You've got people out here who live in the area that you're going to need to reach out to and make sure that when they walk into your tents they're going to feel warmly welcomed and there's going to be something there for them. Here's one, one tip I can give you right away. I write this in the book. We've been studying mega churches. I'll bet you have a mega church in this area. You know my first suggestion to you? Go as a team from your synagogue and visit that church. And you go watch how they greet the stranger. You go see how they greet the, and welcome people in. It's unbelievable. I go take my students to Saddleback Community Church in Orange County. The pastor's a guy named Rick Warren. You may know his name. Rick Warren's become a good friend of mine. And I take my students every semester to visit that church because those people know how to build a sacred community. They really know. Huh? No, that's not about money. It's about how you welcome people in and how you welcome them in warmly for as long as they want. You know what our big problem is in synagogues? We say you got to pay us dues and a big check before we serve you. Okay? There is a group though in America, the fastest growing religious group in the Jewish community, that doesn't, has exactly the opposite model. First we'll serve you, then we'll ask you for money. Their names are Chabad. So this new book that's coming out in three weeks, I have a case study of Chabad. 
And it's unbelievable. I went to the last two Chabad Shluchim conferences. The rabbi, uh, rabbis are called Shluchim messengers. Uh, the story of how I got there is pretty amazing. I'll tell it to you quickly. I'm in a Synagogue 3000 meeting, and I'm saying to the group, I'm plotting. Do you know that term? Yeah. I'm plotting. I'm, I'm dying to go to the Chabad rabbi conference. And a guy's in the audience, while I'm still speaking, his name's Rabbi Daniel Brenner, and he texts to a guy in St. Louis, a Chabad rabbi named Hershey Novak, Ron Wolfson says he wants to go to the Chabad conference. I'm still speaking. And Hershey texts back to Rabbi Daniel Brenner, I'll invite him. Next thing I know, I have instructions of how to go to the Chabad Shluchim conference in Brooklyn, the single largest sit-down dinner in New York City the last three years. Last year it got so big, they, they used to, the one I went to is at the, the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, which they, where the QE2 disembarks, where there were 5,000 Chabad rabbis and me. <laughs> there were so many, have you ever been on a cruise? Do you know there were like two little lanes of traffic to get into this yeah. place? And I'm stuck in traffic. So I call Rabbi uh, Novak, who had invited me, and I'm supposed to meet him. I say, Hershey, I'm going to be late. He says, don't worry, I'll leave the event. I'll come and I'll meet you at the curb. But I said, but how am I going to know it's you? He says, I'm the guy in the black hat and the beard. <laughs> and you know what? He did. He left, the, he left the event, he met me at the curb, he whisked me through security, brought me to a, cute, a, a prime table, introduced me to all the top people in Chabad. I have a Chabad rabbi meeting my students this Wednesday uh, in Los Angeles, my rabbinic students, because there's a lot to learn from those guys. A lot to learn from those guys. And the number one thing to learn from them is that their tent is wide open at the very beginning, before you have to pay any money, and they'll build a relationship with you, and they'll teach you, and they'll invite you for Shabbat dinner or lunch in 10 seconds, and then they'll come and ask you for money. They're very aggressive fundraisers. But they raised a billion dollars last year, which is the same amount of money the Federation system in North America raises in their annual campaign. Some of our synagogues are merging and, and consolidating, and they're building multi-million dollar synagogue buildings. So you ask me what's going on, and I'll tell you, we got a lot to learn about our congregations and building tents that are welcoming, and they're built on relationships, not programs. Uh, okay, one more thing about a tent, and then we're going to study some Torah. Yes, sir? Less upkeep, no, no bricks and mortar. No bricks and mortar, less upkeep. Well, you know what? Here's the truth of the matter is, the synagogues can move. They're flexible. And you can merge, and you can move locations, and that's okay to be closer to where the people are. And that's a good thing to do. All right, well, let's uh, fast forward to uh, the key text in our tradition that talks about how to create a warm and welcoming tent. It's on the other side of your sheet. So let's do this. Let's take uh, five minutes, five minutes, and we'll study the text together, but we're going to do it in traditional Jewish text study style, which is called chevruta learning. Chevruta comes from the word chaver, which means friend. So chevruta study is quite interesting. Chevruta study goes like this. Can you guys over there see me? I turn a chair around. I sit with my chaver. Two people. Sit, please. We put the text between us. We read the text out loud. Some people, one partner will read the text, the other will just listen. Or you can share, it doesn't matter, whatever you want to do. But in another minute, this whole room is going to be full of this Torah. And we're going to read the text out loud, and then we're going to ask ourselves, what is this text trying to teach us about building a sacred community, a good tent that's welcoming of strangers? Got it? So now here's what I'd like you to do. Five minutes, go meet another new person in the room you don't know. Sit one-on-one, -on -one, read the text, and discuss this question. We'll see what you come up with. What does this text teach us about building 
a warm and welcoming synagogue. One, two, three, go. Go, go, go. Go meet somebody. Gary, what time do you think you'll go to? 8.30 max? Yeah. It'd be enough. Great. Good. Go, go learn. Sit face to face. Sit face to face. Move the chairs. I gotta go around. Here, there's a guy right here. Sit with him. Michigan. I was a professor there. Oh, really? We only had 40 Jewish families in our synagogue. Wow. So tell a story about that. I had seven languages there. Mm. Gary, we should set up the books too so that we're ready to go. Okay? Do you have a partner? I don't have a partner. Sit with someone. Just yeah. grab it here. Okay, right here. Grab a chair, sit with these guys, or wherever you want. Turn the chair around. I don't want to know. You got a new friend. Do you have somebody? Do you have somebody to talk to? Okay. Oh, okay. Good? We are. You learned something? And what is your Hebrew name? Gershon. Gershon. Clump of oak trees. something? Um, okay, good. What? She brought up a very interesting question. Okay. Was Abraham hospitable because that's how he was? Or was it because of the act of the circumcision's connection to God? It's a good question. It's a great question. You make... 
You make your own midrash, your own commentary. It's beautiful. Okay, one more minute. One more minute. You learning something? Yeah, we, we've come up with a good thought. Okay, good. It's about to... <laughs> I have to tell you my little story. Please. I'm a young guy, 1944 in the Navy. I've been away from home for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I was in Tacoma, Washington, and I was a religious guy. Mm. So what do I do on a Friday night? I go to a little show mm -hmm. in Tacoma, Washington. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Mm. I was in my uniform, and nobody said hello to me. And you know what? I still remember sure it since 1944. Terrible. Okay, let's wrap up. Very good. Hi. Okay, everybody, let's get back together. Come on. You guys got, uh, oh, you're making a, a network already. Here we go. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. You can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. You can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. You can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. Just turn your chairs around, you're good, right where you are. It's okay. Careful. Okay, so, let's, uh, let's talk about Abraham and Sarah's tent. What is going on in this story that can inform the way we ought to be building sacred communities, synagogues of the 21st century. Warm and welcoming synagogues, please. Not just welcoming, but going out of his way to welcome. Yeah, go out of your way to welcome. So we need to be more evangelical about our business. I call in this book, uh, Spirituality of Welcoming, we need evangelical Jews. We're not wired for this. I'm gonna tell you that right up front. We are not wired for this. My daddy was wired for this. May he rest in peace. My daddy was from Brooklyn, New York. He married my mom, moved out to Omaha, Nebraska. Zadie, my beloved Zadie, gave, had four daughters. It's like Fiddler on the Roof. All four daughters married guys, and each guy got an equal share of the business right off the bat. And my dad was the most gregarious man, most welcoming man I ever met. You met my dad in an elevator on the first floor. By the time you got to the sixth floor, he knew your story, and you darn sure, he darn sure knew, you knew his for sure, right? He was that kind of guy. So, um, yeah, we've got to be the first wave. We've got to go out and meet people, and we are not wired to do it. That's why this book's important. That's why the training we'll do on Sunday is important, because we can learn how to do it. If Disney can teach people how to be friendly, we can do it too. I went to the Disney University, and it was the single best professional development experience in my career. And I knew I was in the right place the minute I walked towards the ballroom in the Dolphin Hotel in Orlando. Because standing at the front door of that ballroom where I'm going to be working for four days, guess who was there to greet me? Not Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and not Walt Disney, no. <laughs> that would have been good if Walt showed up. Not Michael Eisner either. Who was there? Nope. Who was there? Who? The presenters. My two teachers who were going to work with 75 people from some of the biggest companies in America that were there to learn the Disney secrets of quality service. They were at the front door greeting me. I was thrilled because they were going to work with me and the first thing they taught me was to stand at the door. They didn't teach me this. My Zadie taught me this. How many of you met me at the front door before you walked in here tonight? Come on. That's the single most important thing I will do all weekend is to model for you how easy it is, but you have to be intentional about it. 
you got to be able to give up your davening for five minutes and go over and say Shabbat Shalom to somebody. That's what Abraham did. Okay, what you got from this story? Well, what I got from it was you, you can't be in a rush. You've got to take time. Well, you take time, but you are in a rush to go greet them, right? How do you know that from this text? He ran. Look, look, at, look at the, in the Hebrew, it's even more dramatic. But if you really want to know a biblical text, you read the verbs. So you look again at this text and show me the verbs that indicate running. Look in the first paragraph, line three. He ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. Now look in the second paragraph. He hastened, the word is Yemaher. He hastened, he hurried to the tent and said to Sarah, what? Hurry up. Hurry up. Get those three sayas of choice flour. And then what does he do in the second sentence? Abraham ran to the herd to get the calf and gives it to the servant boy who hastened, hurried to prepare it. I call this in my book, it's a text in a hurry. This is a Jewish text in a hurry. This is, there's a reason that the rabbi, or whoever, God, wrote this this way. It, the indication is, you got to be in a hurry to go greet the stranger. So what else did you learn from this text in your Hevruta, please? Um, that here he was, the Lord had appeared to him, but oh. he saw the strangers, and, and he ran to them. Oh, the Lord, thank you. Nine times out of ten when I teach this, people don't get that. Look at the first five words of this text. The Lord appeared to him, Abraham. Well, that means exactly what you just said. Somehow Abraham's in an encounter with God. Three strangers come by. Does he know who they are? Does he know they're angels from God and going to tell him he's going to have a baby with Sarah? No, he has no idea who they are and you don't know either. You have no clue who walks into your synagogue. And it shouldn't matter if we really believe that every human being is made in the image of God and we're really going to greet everybody who walks into our place with warmth and welcome. It doesn't matter who they are. They're rich or they're poor, they're gay or they're straight. What difference does it make? Let's welcome them into our tent. And, you know, the rabbis have a field day with this. In the, in the Midrash, in the commentaries, one says it means that Abraham is worshiping. That's the way we talk to God. One says Abraham is studying. That's the way we hear God's voice. Either way, he's in a relationship with God and coming along three strangers. From this, the Talmud deduces the following sentence. It's more important to welcome the stranger than to welcome the Shekhinah, God's presence. That's incredible. Thank you. Uh, you're bliss, you're on the bliss. Uh, what happens one sentence before this text? Abraham circumcises himself at the age of 99. May I talk to the guys in the room for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no way. It's 90, I'm 99. I just did it. You're the moil and you say no problem? No problem because the reason why God waited to such a point in time is that older people require less anesthesia. Well, well, it's good. A mercy on God's it's part. a mercy on God's part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad my kids aren't in there. <laughs> I'm telling you. But look at that. Uh, honest, but honest, really. But, 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 but Rabbi Moyle, listen to me for a second. You know, this is exactly where we get the, idea, the Jewish value of Bikur Cholim, of visiting the sick. Because the rabbis thought Abraham was sick. And here come angels from God to comfort Abraham in his time of illness. But of course, Abraham sees these strangers, he runs to greet them. He's sitting there in the heat of the day, but he runs to greet the stranger. Come on, we can do a better job in greeting people. More horror stories. I go to this... Um, Synagogue in a East Coast Seaboard Coast City starts with the letter B. They just won the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm at a conservative synagogue, and I'm there at 9 o'clock in the morning to meet with a membership committee of the board of the synagogue to talk about this issue. And this is a big conservative synagogue. There was a day school on the campus with 300 kids. The Sisterhood gift shop was open Monday morning. There were 12 people in the office, 
And again, it was before September 11th, granted. I walked around that building for 20 minutes before somebody said hello to me. And guess who the first person was who said hello to me? Winston. His name was Winston, the custodian. How did I know his name was Winston? He was the only one in the congregational building. They had a name tag that I could address by name. Winston, lovely guy. So, I, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. Last horror story for tonight. We'll probably pick up some on Sunday morning. What, Rabbi, what? What, what do with Sarah? I mean, with who? Sarah. Sarah. I mean, this guy comes into our husband to see those Go, of, make cake. Get her to work. I mean, she had something else well, Here's the way I see it. I don't see it that way personally. I see it as Abraham got called out the troops. He called on Sarah. He called on the servant boy. And you know what it means to me? I know. But here's what it means. Look, I'm always trying to say, what is it going to mean to you as leaders of synagogues? What it means to me is you cannot depend on two greeters in the back of your sanctuary to do the job. Because I can get past those two greeters and then something terrible can happen. Like this. I start my book with this story. True story. So I'm, I'm in the synagogue in the East Coast city that starts with the letters P-H. <laughs> and I'm the scholar in residence, and Friday night, it's a lovely thing, everybody's there, lovely time, and the rabbi emeritus is in the synagogue that night, and he says to me, Ron, tomorrow they won't make you sit on the pulpit, you can sit with me. I said, fabulous, I'll look for you. Now when I visit a synagogue on Shabbat, I'm there 10 minutes before the service starts. So I show up at 10 minutes to 9 o'clock when the service began in this big, big conservative synagogue. You know who was there at 9 o'clock that Shabbat morning? No Rabbi Emeritus. Winston was there. <laughs> and there were about seven or eight regulars. Do you know what I mean by regulars? They're always there on time. And there were three guests of the bar mitzvah that morning who took the invitation literally. <laughs> they, did, they didn't know. Oh, they, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't ask them. They didn't know the secret you could show up at 1030. So now I walk into this enormous sanctuary, the kind that sleeps 800. So now this is the back two rows of the sanctuary. These two chairs. Can you all see? These are the back two rows. Young man, I need your help. Come here, I want you to play me in this little role play. Sit right here. This is the last row of the sanctuary. This is the second to the last row of the sanctuary. This is the center aisle. Okay? I'm sitting on the end, on the aisle, waiting for the Rabbi Meredith to show up. Because I figure I'll be in the back, I'll see him walk in, and then I'll join him. Right? Good plan. Now the davening starts, the praying starts. Conservative synagogues, you know how they, they're like this a little bit. Okay, good. You're doing fine. And then, about 9.15, I feel a tap on my shoulder. And I look up, you're me, and I see the sweetest man, and he's looking at me with the saddest eyes. The saddest, wait, you got to hear it exactly as it happened. This guy was so sad looking, it broke my heart, because I knew what was coming. And he says to me the following, you know, I wouldn't tell you that you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> That's exactly what he says. I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you that you're sitting in my seat. And then he points to the empty seat on the aisle right behind the last row. He points to that seat. He says, I would sit here, over there. But if I sat there, where would my friend who always sits there sit? <laughs> now I look around. There are 785 empty seats, but that man needs that seat. So what do you think I did? Get up. I got up and I left. Give him a nice round of applause. You did a nice job. I moved. I got out of there. I left. I went and found another seat because I knew that man. I didn't know him by name, but I knew what he was. In fact, in Jewish tradition, we call this by a Hebrew term, makom kavua, your established place in the congregation, the seat you always sit in. And he's right. If his friend is not always in his regular seat, what's he going to think? Something's wrong. Something happened to him. I care about him. I'm in relationship with him. 
I want to know what happened. Where is he? So that's the best part of a sacred community. But if I were a shul shopper, if I were a guest of the bar mitzvah that morning, off my list. I'm not going to come back there again. And there were two greeters at the front door of the sanctuary saying Shabbat Shalom. What could that man have said? We'll pick this up on Sunday morning. What could that man have said to me in that instant that would have welcomed me to the congregation and got him his seat? What could he have said to me? Come on. What's the first thing he could have said to me? Shabbat Shalom. He knew I was a stranger. And then what could he have said to me? Would you like to sit with me? May I sit next to you? Someone else is coming. We might have to move. But welcome to our community. That's my point. Is that we could have greeters up the wazoo and it doesn't make any difference unless we all learn to be greeters. We all learn that we have to be warm and welcoming. What else did you learn from this text? Two more things and then we'll start to wrap up. What? Besides greeting, running yeah. What, what else did they do? Yes. And then their needs were nutrition. Yes. He met their needs. He anticipated their needs. He knew they were hungry. So he made them food. And what kind of food did he give them? The best. So I haven't been to your synagogues yet. But I have a Wolfson scale of 1 to 10. 10 being best. Of Shabbat Kiddush luncheons. And On, egg, on Gay Shabbat. And, and I'm telling you. I've been at our coffee in the, in the lounge. And I'm telling you, this is really important stuff. It makes a difference. I was in a synagogue just three weeks ago, and they said, oh, we're cutting back on the, we don't have the budget. I said, don't cut back on that budget, because you have guests coming into your community. You want to put your best foot forward. Oh, come on. And coffee? I have these families of kids that drop their kids. Do you have this going on in your community? Well, the families come, they drop their kids off, dry cleaning Jewish education. <laughs> you take them four to six, once a week, twice a week, Sunday morning. We drop them off. We'll pick them up. And then you make them Jewish, not too Jewish. <laughs> you pick them up, right? That's really. That, and then where do the families go? Where do the carpool drivers go? They go to Starbucks. So now I'm in family education, and I'm thinking to myself, at least Sunday morning, why should they go run to Starbucks? Let me have Starbucks in the lobby of the synagogue. So I wrote about this in the Spirituality of Welcoming, and now I'm glad to say over the years, Gary, people have been doing this in synagogues. And very creative names for these little cafes. There's one here in the JCC. It's called the Cardo Cafe, which is a nice m memory and remembrance of the Cardo in Jerusalem, I suppose. Um, or it's a cardiologist that sponsored it. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be good? Card, okay, yeah. But I have favorite names myself. I, I was in one synagogue, Java Nagila, they call it. That's cute. Holy Grounds. That, that's a good one. But my favorite of all time for a cafe in a synagogue on a Sunday morning with good coffee, really good coffee, and really good bagels, and really good Danish. Yeah, Mika Mocha. <laughs> Isn't that great? Mika mocha. So bring out the best food that you have. And don't worry about the kashrut issue in here, because that's way before kashrut, milk and meat. And somebody asked me, what are terebinths? Those are a clump of oak trees. But you get the point. The point is that this is the classic text of welcoming. So let me, um, let me wrap up my presentation, and then I'll, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Yes, please. Well, Under-promised and over-delivered, and, over and that's always a good strategy. Excellent. Uh, yes? But also enthusiasm. He created oh. enthusiasm, anticipation. Oh, that's right. And we need to do the same thing. You know, the most shocking thing that has been said to me by my rabbinic students at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at American Jewish University two weeks ago when I started the semester was a young rabbi student said to me, Ron, I don't know if we have the same passion and commitment as the Chabad guys. It broke my heart. I say, because if we don't, if our students don't, we're cooked. <coughs> now, I believe that we do. 
I told this young man that I believed in his heart of hearts. He has the same kind of passion and commitment and willingness to do what's absolutely necessary to make our synagogues outstanding places that people are going to want to join and belong to and get involved in. And that's this, passionate leadership. There's people who are so passionate about Jewish life, they live it, they breathe it, and most of the rabbis I know, especially the ones in this room, are that kind of rabbi. You're blessed to have them. And the canners the same way, and the Jewish educators the same way, and the people who work in this JCC the same way. But I'll tell you folks, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hint of this new book. It's not out yet. In three weeks it'll be out. I've been spending six months writing it. It's called Relational Judaism. Using the power of relationships to transform the Jewish community. Because it's not about programs. We can have a calendar of programs in our synagogues and our JCCs, and they're wonderful. You can have a lecture coming from Los Angeles. That's a nice evening. Everybody comes, has a good time, and then goes home, and so what? I was entertained. It means nothing if there aren't moments in that program that build relationships, where I can meet other people in my community, where I can connect more deeply to the Jewish experience on a variety of levels where we have relationships that fuel our community, where there's no question that I'm not going to drop my membership in a synagogue when my youngest kid is bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or goes off to college, which is exactly what happens in a lot of communities. We join to get the kids in the bar mitzvah thing, and then as soon as that's over with, that's the indictment of synagogues that are fee-for-service institutions. We need to move from fee for service to relational, from transactional to relational. The beginning of that process is in a warm welcome to the people who come into our midst and say to them, we're thrilled you're here. Welcome, Shabbat Shalom, have some good food. Let me introduce you to someone who's just, who's, you just moved to what neighborhood? What neighborhood are you in? Oh, I'm living in Virginia Beach. Oh, really? Let me introduce you to the Greenbergs. They're from Virginia Beach. But we, if our synagogues aren't offering face-to-face -face sacred communities that give us a sense of meaning, figuring out what life really means, a sense of purpose where we know that we're here to do something. I call it in my book God's To-Do List, and now I have a new book called Be Like God for Kids 8 to 12 Years Old. Uh, it's a kid's version of God's To-Do List. I'm very excited about it. It has a whole super power theme, it's kind of a comic book theme, and kids seem to love it. If our purpose in life is not to be God's partner on earth, I don't know what Jewish life is all about. I don't know what a synagogue is for, unless it's to encourage us and inspire us to feel that we can be God's partner on earth and make the world a better place. That's a sense of purpose. And a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a place where we can know that our friends are going to be there for us in good times and in bad and a sense of blessing, a place to come and celebrate those great times in our lives, those key life cycle moments, because you can't do it by yourself, I don't think. I just came off this great bris experience, Hakuna Matata, <laughs> and our friends and family were there, and if they weren't there, what? It's, a, it's an OBGYN doing a little snipping in the hospital. No. This is, this is a sacred moment that you want to share with people, share the blessings in your life. So I feel blessed to uh, have been invited to come and work with you. And I look forward to seeing you over the weekend. Um, I'll spend, let's spend five, six minutes with some questions and answers and then we'll let you go home. Or you can watch the Lakers and the Celtics on uh, TNT. Yeah. I got a vision of sorting with you said today about greeting when uh -huh. a stranger comes in our show and I just have a picture if this works out the way you say stranger walks in 50 members rush them and scare them <laughs> no no don't do that don't do that and by the way it's a good question it's a really good question do you know 
right. No, no, I know you exaggerate, but I'll, I'll give you a little hint again from the megachurches, because I've studied these guys for 20 years now. You can go to Saddleback Church for two, three, four years, and no one's ever going to say, would you stand up and introduce yourself? Because they know a lot of people don't want that. They don't want that. You know, we rush to greet, so we might say, if anybody's new here, stand up. And it might be embarrassing to people. And you don't want to do that either. So I think you have to do it, we have to be smart about it. You know, all I'm saying is, hey, I'm at the Onek Shabbat, and I see somebody I don't know. I might just go over and say, Shabbat Shalom. Hi, I'm Ron. What's your name? What's your name? Hi, hi, Harry. Well, are you from those parts? Yes, oh, really? Really, Virginia Beach. Did you grow up here? No. No, where'd you grow up? Pittsburgh. Oh, I know someone in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Sid Schwartz is from Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. You remember Sid? Oh, yeah, he went to the... You know, so what, in two minutes, I begin to hear his story, and he hears my story. So after the warm greeting, that's the next step. Sharing your stories, getting to know somebody, even in that five minutes, you can do it. Uh, but no, you don't want to rush the people. No, no, no. No, don't do that either. A note to my story. Yes? I exaggerated on the 50. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Small well, uh, synagogue. Right. Question. Question, response, please. Sometimes you don't know it's a stranger you're about to walk up to. So it it might be a member of the synagogue for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot too. I don't say it's nice to meet you. I say it's great to see you. It's great to see you. So that avoids that problem. Rabbi, I've been a member for 25 years. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, and people say to me all the time, there has to be some, some effort on the part of the stranger, too. But they're there. They're there for the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, God forbid they're saying Kaddish. Uh, and, you know, it's important. It's important. Yeah, please, sir. Another show, Family Time. Yeah. Oh, Alex, too, gives a speech. Uh -huh. Someone says he knows a great speech. It was so sincere. Yeah. He said, yeah, I tried to put a lot of that in there. <laughs> so that, in, in sort of getting our people and training them, trying to get them to do this. Yeah. You need, to, you, you need to do it with great sincerity. You do. I'll try to throw a lot of that in there. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? Really do it? Well, I'll tell you what. One thing we'll talk about on Sunday is you got to pick your people who are greeters well. You can't, you know, there are a couple things about that. Number one, uh, uh, look, I went to that Disney course and I met some Disney people, they're called cast members. Um, <laughs> who had drunk the Kool-Aid, and, uh, and th but, but they had this plastic smile on their face all the time. It's like I wanted to say to the guy, would you stop smiling, please? You know, are you a real human being? Or are you this robot? That turned me off. But other people I met there are really sincere about their passion for the organization, for the company, for their mission, which is to be the happiest place on earth. And they, they get it, and they're good at it. Uh, I don't know what your bank is. My bank now is uh, Chase Bank, and boy, they've trained their people something big in the last couple of months because it's a complete 180 degree turn from what it used to be when I walked into my bank. We'll talk more about this on Sunday, but you got it. So, and one other important point about this is what's the first question somebody asks when they walk into a synagogue? Where's the bathroom? No. <laughs> no. Not what page are we on? No. I mean, literally in the building. The well, first, you've got to find the place. You know, you've got to find the sanctuary. Our, our buildings are terribly signed, most of them. We'll talk about that on Sunday, too. What's the first thing? Who's the well, who's the rabbi? That's a good one, but it's not really. How long the service? Where can I pick up my coat? No, the first thing somebody who's shul shopping asks when they come into a synagogue. Nope. No. Is there anybody else here like me? Is there anybody else here with kids my age? Is there anybody else here in my life stage? Is there anybody else here I can be a friend with? So if all your greeters are of a certain age, think it through. You're trying to reach young Jewish adults like we are in our Next Door project, DOR, Next Generation project. You know, the average age in most of our synagogues is 50-something and up. And you know what's going on in Jewish life today. I don't know. How many of you got married before the age of 25? Haha, uh -huh. keep your hands up. How about before the age of 30? Uh huh. 
How about the age of before? Uh, now, put your hands down. Who got married after 30? Yeah, well, see, six. So, well, who's not? <laughs> you look? Uh, no, 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 here's my point. My point is that synagogues are getting squeezed by baby boomers who are aging and figure there's nothing left here for me, so they're dropping out. And a whole generation of young Jewish adults that are waiting well into their 30s to get married or to have a kid, which is the main motivation to belong to a synagogue. So now we have a much smaller uh, base upon which to build our communities. So in Synagogue 3000, we now have five experiments going on in different cities around the country. Atlanta, Miami, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, where we've help the synagogues, this is money from the Marcus Foundation from Atlanta, that's Bernie Marcus, from the Home Depot, to hire an engagement rabbi. A young rabbi, youngish rabbi, whose job it is to be out of the building 60% of the time. Having coffees with young Jewish adults who are in the area, who are 29 years old and wouldn't walk into the synagogue for love or money. That's right. Yeah. And I have a 34-year-old who just moved to Portland, Oregon, and he's, as I say in this new book, he's homeless. Oh, he, has a, he bought a nice house, but he's spiritually homeless. He has no relationship with a rabbi, no relationship with a synagogue. He grew up in a warm Jewish family. We sent him to Jewish day school, Camp Ramah, Hebrew High, and his parents are in the business. But he's 34, and he's totally disconnected. And I don't expect him to be connected, but I'd love to have a young rabbi who'd call him up in Portland and say, you want to go out with coffee? Because he's living 20 years of his life without a connection to the Jewish community. That's inexcusable. So I don't know if we can do that here in this neighborhood, but I think it's something to think about. We're trying to... We're, you bet. You bet. They started at college campuses. Yeah. All right, exactly. So the whole idea, just to, just to wrap this up with a bow and then I'll let you go home, or you can watch the Lakers and the Celtics <laughs> on TNT, is uh, it's all about relationships. Relationships begin with a warm welcome. Our synagogues are going to thrive in the future if we can offer them face-to-face -face community and a good tent to be a part of. So uh, let's end with this. Uh, may I ask you to do one really crazy thing here in the Tidewater Basin? Is that where we are? Tidewater? Yeah. What do we call it? Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. Okay. The new name. Okay. Well, I got to give you a new name. It's a new name is the Matovu community. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to stand up and put your arms around each other. It's a California thing. Come on, everybody. Let's see a big arms around each other. All right, wait, 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 Every, come on, you guys come over, you guys come over, and let's sing together. Ah, what? Akad, Shayim, Shalom. Matovu, Ohalecha, Yaakov, Mishkenotecha, Yeh. I want this row, turn around and face them, turn around. Matov. Now look at each other. Oh, Alright, God bless you all. Thank you for coming. I got books out here if anybody wants them.